So today we're going to talk about how to do a rhetorical praise And this is one of the first things that you're going to be learning that gets you closer to college. Before you've been asked to summarize chapters, summarize stories, and that's essentially what a rhetorical praise does, but it actually does a lot more. We get the word praise from the word precise. What we do is we talk about not only the article's main idea, but we talk about who the author is, who they're writing to, and how they're writing to that person. Its purpose is to help you do a quick analysis of a piece. This way the reader should be able to know the contents, purpose, and if there's any particular bias on the writer's part. It consists of four sentences, and each sentence is specifically formulated to do a different function. You will want to take a piece of paper and write down the sentences and also the examples. You'll have this as a model for when you're asked to do a rhetorical praise on your own. The first sentence contains all of the MLA bibliographic information about the piece. It must include the name of the author. Now, if there is no author, then it is the publisher that becomes the author of the piece. It also needs to contain the genre of the work. Is it a magazine article, newspaper article, journal entry? Whatever type of piece it is, that's what you want to put in. You also need the title of the work. In the parentheses in MLA format, you need the date of publication. Then you need a rhetorically accurate verb. What this means is you have somebody who is speaking in a certain way to an audience. How strongly are they speaking? They can assert a point. They can argue a point. They can suggest something or imply or claim. Notice that the tone changes with each one of those words. So however the author has argued the piece, that is what you want to put in the verb. Then there's going to be a that clause. He asserts that. He argues that. And then that's followed by the main idea or the major assertion. Think of it this way. Who are you talking about? What is the author's background? What did he write? When was it written? And what is his point? Here are some rhetorically accurate verbs that can help you when you're writing this first sentence. It's a good idea to take a picture of these, to get familiar with them, and to use as many of them as possible. So make sure that you stop this video and write down the words. And if there's any that you don't know, look them up. See how strong they are. What temperature are they in terms of how strongly or how weakly the writer has given the point? This is a first sentence from an article that you've read, Two Cautionary Tales of Gun Control by Joyce Malcolm. Notice how everything in here is placed so that it is in one sentence, but it still contains all the major information. In the Wall Street Journal opinion piece, opinion piece is the genre. Wall Street Journal is the publisher. Here's the title. Two Cautionary Tales of Gun Control. Its date of publication, and this is the MLA format, date, month, year. Author Joyce Malcolm explains that's the rhetorically accurate verb. That, and then here is the main idea. Gun control is not effective in preventing violent actions as it has already been tried in other countries and failed. Take a moment to write this sentence down. The second sentence is an explanation of the evidence and development the author uses to support the thesis, and it's done in chronological order. Think of it as an outline of the actual essay or article. How does the author prove his thesis? Does he offer interviews, official data, 
or other outside sources. What kinds of evidence does he produce? Personal anecdote, statistics, any type of data or any type of evidence you will want to include, but you don't want to include specific data, just the type of data that it is. Here's an example of the second sentence from that same article. Malcolm describes anecdotal evident events, first from England and then Australia, in which violent shootings led to more gun control laws that only resulted in responsible citizens being stringently punished for minor gun infractions or no infractions at all. It's a mouthful, and it basically tells everything that Malcolm does in the article. Anecdotal events is the type of evidence that she's producing. First from England, and then from Australia. This is the chronological order in the article. Then why did she bring forth these pieces of evidence? To prove this point. Violent shootings led to more gun control laws, but that kind of inhibited them from protecting themselves. Sentence three it is a statement of the author's purpose followed by in order to phrase to indicate the action the audience should take. So this is what the, second, the third sentence does. What is the author trying to do with his audience? How does he want to affect that audience in order to accomplish something? It will start with one of our favorite verbs. It will be to entertain, to inform, or to persuade. But there will probably be some action that, the, uh, that he wants the audience to do. This sentence tells why the author chose to write this particular work. Take a look at this example. Again, starting with the verbs to inform, to persuade, to entertain, or to explain. Malcolm's purpose is to inform her readers in order to have Americans reconsider asking for stricter gun measures, explaining that added regulations cannot stop violent acts with guns, but rather they infringe on the constitutional rights of U.S. citizens. Notice that we have one of our favorite verbs. This one is to inform. She doesn't really ask for the audience to do anything, therefore it's not persuading. But she does want the audience to take another look at the stricter gun measures. Take a moment to write down this sentence. Finally, the fourth sentence is a description of the intended audience or the relationship the audience author establishes with the audience through tone. Who is going to read this piece? Now, just because you were in an English class and your teacher forced you to read it does not mean that you are the intended audience. As a matter of fact, with this audience being those from the Wall Street Journal, then we know who the audience really is. We can guess because of who buys the Wall Street Journal. You can usually tell age, occupation, gender, location in the United States or elsewhere, ethnicity, particular interests, culture, and people with certain education. You also want to consider whether the audience is receptive or hostile, and whether he addresses them in a formal or informal manner. That's where tone comes in. Look at this last sentence. Using a mild tone, peppered with rhetorically loaded words such as massacre and emotional, Malcolm hopes to persuade her audience of, and this is who reads the Wall Street Journal, educated and affluent American readers who may advocate stricter gun control or who are undecided on the issue to reconsider their stance. This is a tricky one because you have to make a lot of inferences or a lot of guesses as to who the audience really is. And those clues come from where is it published, when is it published, 
And is there any audience really mentioned in the article? Make sure you write this fourth sentence down. So this is what the rhetorical precy looks like altogether. Notice that it is one paragraph, a rather lengthy one, yes, but we start with the indent, and all the sentences are written together with no spaces in between. In the Wall Street Journal opinion piece, Two Cautionary Tales of Gun Control, 26 December 2012, Joyce Malcolm explains that gun control is not effective in preventing violent actions as it has already been tried in other countries and failed. Malcolm describes anecdotal events, first from England and then from Australia, in which violent shootings led to more gun control laws that only resulted in responsible citizens being stringently punished for minor gun infractions or no infractions at all. Malcolm's purpose is to inform her readers in order to have Americans reconsider asking for stricter gun measures, explaining that added regulations cannot stop violent acts with guns, but rather they infringe on the constitutional rights of U.S. citizens. Using a mild tone peppered with rhetorically loaded words such as massacre and emotional, Malcolm hopes to persuade her audience of educated and affluent American readers who may advocate strict gun control or who are undecided on the issue to reconsider their stance. This may be easier than the summaries you used to do. It's only the four sentences and actually the hardest one is that second sentence where you have to get the uh, outline into that second sentence. But it actually becomes quite easy if you know that you're only writing four sentences and that each sentence has its own purpose. So make sure you have this model with you. You'll be asked to write many rhetorical praises in the modules to come.